When talking about black history in America, we have to start in Portugal. Weird, right? So let me connect the dots real quick. In the mid 1400s, a man named Gomez Yanez de Zurara, a fervent Christian and Portuguese chronicler of the slave trade, was the first Christian author to publish a defense of the African slave trade. His argument? The enslavement of Africans is actually missionary work. He published ideas in his book, The Chronicle of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea. In his book, he detailed the horrible scenes of African families being broken up, but taking solace in the fact that they would be owned by Christians who would give them the gospel of Jesus. For Dezurara, blacks were incapable of knowing Jesus of their own free will. They were simply too morally corrupt. Slavery was the God-ordained way to save the souls of savages. His ideas became so popular that other European countries, Spain, Italy, Britain, Holland, France, they all followed suit. They all began reframing and refocusing the African slave trade, not as evil, but as God's righteous gospel work to civilize the savage people. So fast forward 170 years later with these ideas about Africans firmly in place. It's August 1619 in the New World. A Portuguese slave ship, the San Juan Baptista, carrying 350 Angolans to Latin America, was hijacked by pirates. They took 60 Angolan slaves and headed east towards Jamestown, Virginia. They sold 20 slaves to George Yardley, the governor of Virginia, who owned a thousand-acre tobacco farm. Yardley, who also held the power to set tobacco prices, found himself in a win-win situation. Free slave labor plus setting tobacco prices plus Free slave labor, plus doing missionary work, plus free slave labor ensured his economic future in the harsh new world. For the 20 slaves, we don't know their names. It was all lose-lose. This is how slavery began in America. Two important ideas to note. Slavery is God's plan for the salvation and civilization of blacks. And slave labor is is necessary for the economy. These two guiding truths guided every institution, government, education, politics, economics, rights, immigration, and religion in regards to how it discriminated against black people. A quick side note, you can't divorce African slavery from Christian theology. America began with two groups of religious settlers, the Anglicans of Jamestown, Virginia, and the Puritans of Plymouth, Massachusetts. The Anglican faith was the official Church of England. Puritans were dissenters from the Church of England, wanting to establish a purer Christianity. There were enough different religious differences between these two groups, but one thing they both had in common, white superiority. Both Puritans and Anglicans believed they were superior to number one, Native Americans. Number two, black people. The Puritans, being more pure, took it up another notch and added that they were better than number three, Anglicans, and everyone else that was not a Puritan. It's also important to note that along the way there were Christians who opposed slavery. The Mennonites arrived in Germantown, Pennsylvania in 1683. The Mennonites were Christians from the German and Dutch-speaking areas of Central Europe. In 1688, they circulated an anti-slavery petition denouncing oppression due to skin color. This petition was the first piece of anti-racist writing among the European settlers in colonial America, but their ideas were shut down. And as we'll see, anti-racist ideas in the U.S. were always met with even greater racism. 1776, the Declaration of Independence. The July 4th, 1776 Declaration of Independence is something that all grade school kids had to memorize. Not all of it, just part of it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal. I remember memorizing those words as a kid and thinking, pretty inspiring. But as students of the Bible, you learn to exegete documents more carefully. Should all men be taken literally or figuratively? Taken figuratively, all men means all people, all genders, all races, all color, all classes are equal. Taken literally, all men would refer to men only, 
the men who were the decision makers, the landowners, the people in power, the people represented by the kind of men who were actually writing the document. Taking figuratively, it meant that men and women would be equal and have equal rights, but women never had the right to vote until 1920. Side note, interesting, black men were given the right, the legal right to vote in 1870. Taken figuratively, all men would also mean that white men and black men are equal and have equal rights, meaning that black men had the unalienable right to not be owned by white men. But each of the 13 original colonies had their own laws in regards to black people, like black people can't marry white people. Slaves were slaves for life. Slaves were treated as property and could be brought, bought, sold, or given away. Slaves could not own their own property. In courts, no testimony could be made by a slave against a white person. It was illegal to teach a slave to read or write. However, some devout white Christians educated slaves to enable the reading of the Bible to secure their salvation. So from the humble Jamestown and Plymouth villages to the 13 colonies ready to declare their independence, freedom was whites only. The Declaration of Independence was a contradiction. In that one sentence, it freed and empowered one group while oppressing and disenfranchising another. This contradiction was indicative of the men who wrote it because most owned slaves, most notably Thomas Jefferson, who grew up non-religious on his father's plantation that housed the second largest number of slaves in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson advocated for the freedom of slaves, but at the same time owned a large plantation with slaves. Jefferson had children with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings, but he publicly stated that slaves could never assimilate into America because they were inferior by nature. When Jefferson became president in 1801, he helped to pass legislation to outlaw the import and export of slaves from abroad. But at the end of his life, owning some 200 slaves, he sold all of them to pay off his debts. Contradiction. It's important to note that as America was becoming America, land of the free, home of the brave, liberty and justice for all, it began to struggle more and more with the contradiction. How can it claim to be a place of freedom when slavery is God's plan for the salvation and civilization of blacks? How can America claim justice when its economy was built off the backs of a slave labor? As the slave population grew, so did abolitionist movements. Slaves in the South began escaping to the North, uh, to the North states that abolished slavery. There were slave revolts. Three of the most well-known were Gabriel, Pos Gabriel Prosser in Virginia in 1800, Denmark Vesey in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822, and Nat Turner's slave rebellion in Southampton County, Virginia in 1831. But the real battle was taking places in church pews before ultimately spilling out into civil war in 1861. Before the political division on the issue of slavery, churches led the way. It's both good and bad. Good that half the churches believed it was unjust for people to own people. It was bad because the other half believed God ordained slavery for the salvation and civilization of blacks. And both sides used the careful exegesis of scripture to back it up. More than 30 years before the Civil War of 1861, congregations were already debating the issue of slavery. The three largest denominations in America eventually split. Presbyterians split in 1838. The Methodists split in 1844, and the Baptists split in 1845. Why couldn't the church agree on such a fundamental issue that appears so obvious to us today? I don't know. But I do know for myself that sin runs deep, and I have an incredible capacity for self-deception and lostness, which is why I'm always in need of grace. For Southern churches, I think it comes down to a few things. Number one, Bible teaching. Congregations were told that whites were the most civilized people on earth, and the gospel would only take hold of blacks only within the institution of slavery. Blacks were such savages that they needed slavery. This narrative was ingrained since the first settlers came from Europe. Pastors owned slaves. 
Seminary founders owned slaves, professors owned slaves, college presidents owned slaves, and they all defended it as a God-ordained institution. Even churches owned slaves. Churches would rent out their slaves to, former, to other farmers in order to pay for the pastor's salary. At the same time, Southern pastors were also preaching to blacks the gospel that came to save them, which Jesus did. But although their souls were equal, their DNA was not. It was so unequal that they could still own you. I could beat you. I can abuse you. I can sell you all to the glory of God. That's the first reason. The second is really simple. Economics. It's about money. Tobacco and cotton economy of the South could only remain profitable with free labor. And the third reason is that the principalities and the powers got a foothold in the church through hate. After the Civil War, the North won, of course, slavery ended, and African Americans lived happily ever after. All men are equal now, right? Like I said, when anti-racist movements take hold, racism always looks for another way. Some blacks, because they were illiterate, they stayed with their master because they didn't have other options. It's not like people in the South wanted to give blacks good paying jobs. Calls for reparations to give former slaves land of their own were shouted down. Racism was finding a new way to suppress blacks. Enter the Jim Crow era, 1870 to 1968. Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalized racial segregation. Named after a black minstrel show character, The laws, which existed for about 100 years from the post-Civil War era until 1968, were meant to marginalize African Americans by denying them the right to vote, denying them the right to hold a job, to get an education or other opportunities. Jim Crow laws were spread all over the country, not just limited to the South. Laws segregated parks, theaters, restaurants, waiting rooms, buses, trains, water fountains, restrooms, building entrances, elevators, cemeteries, public schools, public pools, amusement park cashier windows, hospitals, asylums, jails, residential homes for the elderly and handicapped. Laws forbade African Americans from living in white neighborhoods. In Atlanta, African Americans in court were given a different Bible from white people to swear on. Voter laws were created to restrict Black and Native American votes by requiring voters to pass a literacy test or the requirement of owning land and even a poll tax. These laws were challenged by the civil rights movement that began shortly after World War II and ended in the early 70s. Quick timeline. In 1948, President Harry Truman ordered integration in the military. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education that educational segregation was unconstitutional, bringing to an end the era of separate but equal education. In 1964, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, which legally ended the segregation that had been institutionalized by Jim Crow laws. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act halted efforts to keep minorities from voting. The Fair Housing Act of 1968, which ended discrimination in renting and selling homes. After Jim Crow laws were outlawed, now African Americans lived happily ever after, right? Racism will always look for another way, but we're going to have to talk about that for another time. Until then, know that organizations like the NAACP are still suing states with voter suppression laws. Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative continues to fight against disproportionate sentencing against blacks. And many schools and neighborhoods in every major city in America continue to be segregated. I used to think that blacks and Asians and whites and Mexicans, they just naturally wanted to live by themselves in their own communities. Maybe. But we can't deny that neighborhoods are segregated today, largely due to the effects of Jim Crow laws and persisting attitudes that blacks are still just savages.